اه بس احنا قلوبنا مشغولة بحياتك في الدرجة الأولى عايزينك تسمع وتصلي وصلاتك تصبح مقبولة وتسلم للرب طريقة وتلاقي مشاكلك محلولة في رسالة جاية لك من القلب رسالة من القلب رسالة من القلب In Matthew chapter 9 verse 9 it says As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. I'm going to stop there for a minute. <clears throat> you know, we can read through the Bible, and uh, I, I say this almost every time I speak. When you read through the Bible, your minds have to be open and, and thinking and not just reading and say, you know, I, khalas, I finished my reading for the day and I'm good. You have to be interacting with the Bible and asking who and why and what was their motivation. If we look at uh, verse 9, there's a lot to see in just this one verse. It tells us that uh, Jesus was walking and he saw a man called Matthew. Uh, he is called Matthew, but his name is Levi. And we'll see here that his name is called Matthew, which means gift of God. And it tells us what his job was. He was somebody who collected taxes. And uh, nobody likes somebody who collects taxes. Now, Matthew had a particular job where it says that he would collect taxes sitting in his tax booth. Here's another example of somebody else like Zacchaeus who was a tax collector. And it tells us, that Jesus saw him. And so I asked this question, what did he see in Matthew that made him stop and say, follow me? It wasn't as if Matthew said, Lord Jesus, I am such a sinful person. I'm sorry for the way I've cheated people. Please forgive me. How can I have forgiveness of my sins? Matthew wasn't doing any of that. Matthew was working, actively collecting taxes, and it says Jesus saw him and called out to him. Notice what he says. He says, follow me. He doesn't say to Matthew, yeah, Matthew, you're breaking the law. Follow the Mosaic law. He doesn't say to Matthew, Matthew, you're disobeying God. Follow God. He says to Matthew, follow me. So Matthew has this big decision. And I talked about we all have big decisions to make. Matthew now has a big decision to make. Would he give himself up to gain Jesus? Uh, what would he be giving up? I told you that uh, if you were a tax collector, you had the opportunity to receive taxes more than you needed to collect. And that's why Matthew probably was a wealthy man like Zacchaeus was a wealthy man. Matthew had a lot of money, something that many people are striving for. Uh, just this past week or two, the, the lottery was over $1 billion. Over a $1 billion. And the person who won that lottery ticket overnight became a billionaire for doing nothing but buying a ticket. But millions of people were buying these tickets for the chance for what? For money and the power that money can get you. Thinking, my life, if I win this lottery, my life will change. It will be better. And that's why everybody wants to win that billion dollars. But most people that win that much money, they end up... Uh, depressed, committing suicide, losing their family, and oftentimes broke with no money. Matthew had what everybody was striving for, and Jesus was saying, give it up and follow me. That's a big decision. Uh, there are some in this room and some that are watching who have that decision to make in their life. 
Sometimes Jesus calls us and says, I want you to follow me, and that means leaving your job. I was studying business administration at George Mason University, and God had put it on my heart to go to Bible college. That's a big difference, business administration and Bible college. They both begin with B, but they're completely different. And I just felt the call. God was saying, now to go to Bible college. And I, I, didn't, I didn't obey the call. I drove out there one time, and I went to the parking lot. I drove an hour, and I went to the parking lot, and I couldn't get out of the car. I was too afraid, and I drove back home. And then I went to a retreat, and we were singing that song. We just sang, I surrender all. And I couldn't sing the song because I knew I wasn't surrendering all. And I came back, and I went to the Bible college. And so God is asking some of us here, and I know some that are, are thinking about it, do I leave what I'm doing and pursue God? We heard last week some people are considering going, not leaving their job, but taking their job skills, whether it's in medicine or whatever it might be, and going and serving God as a missionary somewhere else, using the skills that they've learned, following the call of God. Here, Jesus says to Matthew, follow me. That means stop or give up your job as a tax collector. Give up your influence, the money that you would be making, and follow me. If you think about it, when uh, some of the people said to Jesus, I want to follow you, and Jesus said, you want to follow me? I have no home. I have no place to lay my head. You think you're going to follow me because I am a, I'm a famous teacher. The birds of the air have a nest, and the foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has, I have no place to lay my head down. And you want to follow me? So following Jesus was not going to make Matthew rich or famous. This morning I ask you and those that are watching, when Jesus says, follow me, what does that mean to you? How are you following him? When Jesus calls us to follow him, his call is for us to die to ourselves and to live for him. When he says, follow me, he's saying, Nadid, I want you to die to your ambitions and follow me. And what that ever, and what that holds. In Mark 8, 34, Jesus says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and to lose their soul? What is the point of having millions of dollars if your soul is not at peace with God? How many rich people and celebrities do we see all the time committing suicide because their hearts are not at peace with God? In John 12 he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground, into the earth, and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. We are like these seeds, and he's saying, I want to plant you, Nadid, or whoever you put your name. Say, I want to plant you in D.C., or I want to plant you in Jordan, or I want to plant you somewhere else, and I want you to bear much fruit. And you may say, no, God. I'm fine just where I am. And sometimes we don't want to follow his call to die to ourselves. It is a big decision. And Matthew is now point asked to make that decision. If you remember last week, the rich young ruler, when, Jesus, uh, but when he encountered Jesus, he said, Lord, uh, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? His earthly needs were met. He was rich. But he wasn't at peace with God. He said, how may I gain eternal life? And Jesus said, sell everything and follow me. It's the same call. Die to yourself and follow me. And it says he walked away very sad. He had a big decision, and he could not make that decision to follow Jesus. The beauty of this, it says he got up. And he followed Jesus. What was it about Matthew's life that said, I am willing to give this all up for Jesus? It doesn't tell us, you know, 
It doesn't tell us that he had a long conversation with Matthew. It doesn't tell us that Matthew asked him all these questions, and when Jesus answered all his questions, if you think of Nicodemus, Nicodemus went to Jesus and said, Wait, I have all these questions I need to ask you, and he had a conversation with Jesus. With Matthew, it just says, Jesus saw him, he said to him, follow me, and Matthew said, okay, Lord, I'm willing to follow you. And it says he got up, and followed him. It tells us after that, in verse 10, it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. And the Pharisees saw this. I want to, I want to show you something or observe something. It tells us that Jesus saw Matthew. And he saw Matthew with a heart of compassion and love, even though he was hated. It didn't say that Matthew gave it up and then said, okay, Lord, I'm ready to follow you. He was still actively collecting taxes, and Jesus saw him, and he said, even though you are a sinner, even though you are hated by your fellow men, even though you have nothing good in you, I love you, follow me. The Pharisees also saw when Jesus was at this banquet, it says that he was sitting and dining with tax collectors and sinners, and the Pharisees also saw, but they didn't see these people with hearts of compassion and love. They said, how is Jesus eating with these people? If he's a religious man, why would he be eating with these sinners? Notice how they viewed people. They saw people as sinners. Jesus saw people with the eyes of love and compassion. I ask you this morning, when you look at other people, are you seeing them with the love and compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ? Unfortunately, a lot of people, and I hate to say this, I'm not speaking about our church, I'm just saying the church in general. A lot of people avoid the church because they've had a bad experience with the church. They said, oh, I, I went to church and everybody looked at me and pointed out things and very legalistic and they, they didn't look at me with the eyes of love, they judged me. So I'm not going back to church. As Christians, we need to be looking at people with the compassion and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, who saw Matthew not as a tax collector. He saw him as somebody, he said, I want you to be one of my disciples. And that's a, an encouragement for all of us here. You may think, how can I follow Jesus because I am so sinful? He, Jesus looks past our sins. He says, I died for your sins, and I can use you because I love you if you would follow me. There's no sin too great that he cannot forgive. And so the Pharisees are looking at this. They said, Jesus is eating with these sinners. Why is your teacher eating with these tax collectors? And Jesus heard this. He said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. It's often said that the church should not be a museum for Christians. It's a hospital. We come here because we are broken and we are sinners and we need compassion and we need support and love. And unfortunately, a lot of times we come and we say, you know, everything is fine. We're just, it's a museum for Christians. No, this is a hospital where we come and find healing in our Lord Jesus Christ. And those that are hurting, we give them encouragement and love. And Jesus says, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. And he tells them, go and learn. These are the people who are educated. These are the Pharisees. They knew the scriptures. And Jesus is telling them, go read the scriptures. Go learn. I'm sure this was very offensive because they were considered the learned, the educated. He said, go learn what it means when, and he quotes, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. A lot of times we feel like we're doing God a favor by coming to church or, you know, by reading our Bibles and doing our devotions. You know, we're, we're, we're doing God a favor. We're, we're offering, it's, our, it's like our sacrifice. Okay, Lord, you know, here's my sacrifice. I gave you an hour this week. I came to church. I made to D.C. I fought the traffic. I paid the toll. I came to church. Chalas. He says, I don't want your sacrifice. God doesn't want our sacrifice. He wants our heart. 
He says, I want you. I want you. I don't need your sacrifices. The Pharisees thought, you know, we're, we're doing all this in the name of God and religion. And, and he says, I don't want your sacrifices. I want your compassion. You're supposed to be the religious elders. Where is your love and your compassion? I did not call to come to call the righteous, but sinners. People that think they're healthy. He said, I, I don't need, I'm good with God. I'm, I'm healthy. But if you're humble enough to say, I am a sinner and I need God, then Jesus says, I can use you. The Pharisees were too healthy for their own good. They thought, I'm okay with God. They were experts. They were learned. And many of us grew up in the church and we think, I'm okay with God. May we never take it for granted, the grace and mercy of our God, day after day. We preach the gospel to ourselves each and every day and remind ourselves, if it not for the grace of God, there goes I. I would be just like that. All right, I want to ask you a question. If I gave you, well, not I gave you, if you were given the opportunity to write your testimony or your story about your relationship with God and have it in the Bible, how long would it be? If you were given the opportunity to say, well, give us your testimony, write out your testimony. Now, at the Bible college, I took a class on discipleship and they said, okay, we want you to write out, your, you're going to learn how to give your testimony, how to share how God changed your life, and you, you write it out. So, you know, you write it out. If I were to give you some paper, how many pieces of paper would you need to write your testimony? If you look at the Bible, you see the story of Jonah. Jonah is, is you know, it's, it's a short book, but it's the story of how God changed the life of Jonah. And if you think of the, the, the blind man who was healed by Jesus, and uh, the Pharisee says, well, we want a testimony. How were you healed? And the, the parents said, well, you know, they were afraid of the Jewish elders. They said, we don't know. Ask him. And he gave his testimony. He said, listen, all I can tell you is once I was blind and now I see. So I'm asking you, how much room would you need in the Bible to write your testimony? And uh, maybe you may say, well, I don't need any paper because maybe your life hasn't been changed by God. And that's this morning I ask you, you need to take care of that today with God. Just as he called Peter and said, follow me. He's asking you the same thing, to surrender all and follow him. The reason I ask this question is because what book are we in right now? We're in the book of Matthew. And in verse 9, it says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called who? Matthew. In other words, Matthew is writing this book, and he has the chance to write his testimony. And this week, as I'm reading it, I'm like, it's one verse. It's verse 9. That's it. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth, and he said to him, follow me. He got up and followed him. That's it. He had this opportunity to write out what Matthew, what he was thinking about why he left the tax booth, what made him follow Jesus. His testimony is one verse, which is, he called me, and I followed him. Sometimes we make Christianity too complicated. It's a set of rules that I have to go to church and I, I don't want to follow God because it's, you know, I have to do all these things and I can't do these things. It's so simple. Matthew wrote his testimony in one verse. I followed him. I read this and I thought, it's amazing. I would need maybe a few sheets of paper when I wrote my testimony at the Bible college. Matthew had the chance to write it and he used one verse. Look at the humility. In verse 10, it says it happened as he was reclining at the at table in the house. Matthew doesn't say that this was his house. In chapter 10, Matthew refers to himself again. <clears throat> in, in chapter 10, verse 3, Matthew says, 
he gives the names of the disciples. He says, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas. And then he says, Matthew, the tax collector. When the other gospel writers refer to Matthew, they don't call him Matthew, the tax collector. Matthew is so humble that he refers to himself with a title. And it's not a good title. You say, you know, Nazareth, you know, the president or so-and-so, the executive or the CEO. He gave the title of himself that was hated by everyone. He said, Matthew, the tax collector, twice. And in the other gospels, it tells us he was working at this tax collecting booth, but they don't call him Matthew, the tax collector. In Luke chapter five, it tells us that this was the house of Matthew himself. In Luke chapter five, verse 27, it tells us that he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi, or also Matthew, sitting in a tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And Luke says, he left everything behind, got up, and began to follow him. And then in verse 29, it says, and Levi, or Matthew, gave a big reception, or a feast in his house, and there was a big crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with him. Matthew doesn't state in his in his gospel, that it was his house and that he gave a big reception. It was Luke who tells us this, that there was a big crowd of people. We see here the humility of Matthew in writing this. His testimony is simple, I follow Jesus. And he doesn't praise himself and say, you know, and I gave him a big reception at my house and the food I ordered this and I gave him, you know, I, I slaughtered the haruf and all this things for him, no. When we read through the Gospels, when we read through the Bible, we need to be thinking about what we're reading about. This week, I was thinking about how Matthew had this encounter, how he followed Jesus, and how he had the opportunity to explain why he was giving, or giving his testimony and why he was following Jesus. And he made it so simple. He made it not about himself. He made it about Jesus. Some applications I'd like to uh, share this morning. Like Jesus, are we making ourselves available to those around us? He spent time with large groups and small groups with the purpose of bringing hope and truth to those around him. And Jesus saw people that were in need and desperate and he acted upon it. Uh, about a year or two ago, I was riding my bicycle in the neighborhood and I, I passed by a house and there was two ladies outside in their driveway. And as I rode by their house, they didn't say anything to me. They didn't wave me down and say. But as I rode by, I saw the look on their faces. And the look on their faces said they needed help. It was just the way they looked. So I kept going. And then I, said, I turned around and I said, are you guys OK? Do you need help? They're like, can you help us start our car? We have the jumper cables, but we don't know how to use them. Can you help? They didn't say anything to me, but I could see it in their face. And there's people all around you, all around us, around you at home and at work and at school. There's family members, and you can maybe see it in their face that they need peace. There's something wrong. They need compassionate. They need love. Are we looking at people with the eyes of Jesus and seeing them, even though they don't say anything, but you can see it in their face and in their eyes? Are we seeing it, and are we acting upon it? Jesus demands that we follow him. I know many of us here are followers of our Lord Jesus Christ, but have we, have we replaced him with something else? Sometimes we can replace Jesus with a set of rules and say, you know, I'm following these rules. Have we replaced him with something else? We can get caught up in rules and in churches and pastors and say, no, I, I follow this pastor or I follow this church, or our own desires, we need to ask, how are we still following him? And also, are we looking at people with the outward appearance, or do we have compassionate eyes? The, the Bible tells us that the Lord looks at the, the man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Are we looking at people just from the outward appearance and saying, oh, these, these people, they're, they're rebellious, they're sinners. I don't want to be hanging around them. 
Are you seeing yourself as too healthy and too righteous to be with people that need Jesus? Uh, as we sang this song just a little while ago, in verse, in um, the hymnal, Just As I Am Without One Plea, I want to read this last, uh, this, uh, this verse. It says, Just as I am, poor, wretched, blind, sight, riches, healing of the mind, yea, all I need in thee I find, O Lamb of God, I come. Whether you're poor, whether you're rich, whether you're healthy, whether you're sick, he calls us to the same thing, follow him. And I ask this morning, have we made the decision as Matthew made to follow him? Would you bow with me? Oh.